الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters in Islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah It's a pleasure to be back here after it's been quite a while but it's good to be back here a lot of changes a lot of developments and those provide inspiration to the rest of us alhamdulillah this year's lecture series is called The Quiet Before the Storm. What we want to do this year is to take the words, the stances, the thoughts of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and to take a deeper look at them. We're trying to do a couple of things. One of them is obviously we would like to look at our own current situation, connect the dots, learn from the Imam. But in addition to that, we want to learn from the Imam himself, from his companions. And we have a wide range of things. When we say we want to learn from Imam Hussein, we shouldn't think that this is only going to be about the Qiyam of the Imam, which is just a few months, the whole Qiyam of the Imam. Rather, when we're learning from Imam Hussein, especially with what we have in front of us, we see that we can learn from him from before he became the Imam. We can learn after his imamate, even when you divide his imamate into two parts. He was there as our imam and our leader and the leader of the resistance in the time of Muawiyah. There's letters from Imam Hussein to Muawiyah. His stance at that time for us is very important. And then after that, of course, the Qiyam itself, which is unbelievable. And there's so many relevant lessons that we can draw from this. So, what happens is, for us, we kind of approach each Muharram, brothers and sisters, with a sense of urgency. We don't know how many times we have to have these dry runs or practice Muharrams take place before our real test, the living Imam. And what we want to do is we want to have learned those most relevant lessons while there's not live bullets. We want to make sure that we're on the right side of history. When God tests us with the Imam, we're on the right side of history. We've done the right things. We've taken the right stances. The idea of attending these majalis, being here, repeating these things to one another, these truths, attending the masa'ib, repeating the refrains that are there, all of those are pre to prepare us for our test and our Imam. So for us, this is very real. Now, what we're going to try and learn about tonight will be learning from some words that our Imam said about his companions. Those 72, those 100 and so, depending on the narration, those people who made it. There are some very interesting points that we can learn about them. But how we'll start is first seeing how even those companions are relevant for us. How? In this way. If you look at the group of the companions, you'll see that they're a very interesting group of people. Some of the companions are old. Some of the companions are young. Some of the companions knew our Imam from his childhood. They grew up with the Imam. Other companions know they got to meet the Imam along the way. Even the ethnic backgrounds of the companions are very different. Their levels of religiosity prior to the uh, advent of Karbala is also very different. You have some of them who knew the Imam as a child who've been preparing for this great event and you had other people who were very new to the path. There's some people who became Shia on the way. They met the Imam, then they became Shia. So you look at this diverse group, old, young, some people, even the socioeconomic economic sta status of these people was so different. But you do see one thing about these people. 
The thing about these people is that they passed an incredible test. I hope brothers and sisters realize this, and I'm saying this as a, re as a reminder to myself first. We should not think that the test of Karbala was an easy test. That would be a disservice to us ourselves to tell us that, oh, it was just a walk in the park. They did the right thing. They saw the imam. They no, it was an incredible test. Even though the advent of Karbala had been prophesied, people knew from the time of the Prophet wasallam and Amir al-Mu'mineen, they had been told this advent is going to happen. You would think people would have been able to prepare themselves. But no, we found so many people who failed that test. So that comes to tonight's question, which is what made the companions, and inshallah I want to share the words of the Imam about the companion, what made the companion so special? And then if we're trying to look for relevant lessons, we're trying to draw inspiration from this, what do we have to do to be like them? At least to move in that direction. Inshallah we'll begin with a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And I hope brothers and sisters can bear with me. I know right now we're trying to figure out the mic system, so I hope it's not too much to bear. Well, inshallah, we'll get through this together. The one thing that we can say about the companions is this. Their faith was incredibly strong. I want to share the actual hadith, but... Take this from me, their faith was incredibly strong such that the Imam was able to show them their place in paradise before the battle. That's not normal Iman, that's not everyday Iman. I would describe their faith, brothers and sisters, as Iman which was Ashurai. Ashurai. And what I want to talk about is a little bit of that kind of imam. But allow me to talk a little bit about the words of the imam. We'll see where we get the inspiration from. So now I want to share some of the words of the imam about his companions. The imam says this. He says, Inni la a'lamu ashaban awfa wa khayran min ashabi. Truly, this is now Imam Hussein speaking, the ultimate compliment that any imam can give his followers. I know no companions, no ashab, more loyal and better than my companions. Then he talked about his family. And I know no family that's more connected, tighter, more dutiful than my family. The Imam prayed for them. May Allah bless you on my behalf, the Imam praying for these individuals. What happened though, was after that, our Imam was very transparent with his companions. He didn't butter them up. He told them, he said that, whoever stays with me will definitely be killed. So I know you, you're wonderful, no one better than you, you're loyal, you've passed this test, as I've mentioned, just understanding what was at stake and how serious this was and the test that they passed, that would take a discussion on its own. Now they pass that test, the Imam gives them the good tidings, he says that you are the best, but then he gives them an out. The Imam said that you are the best, it's not haram now, you can go. Whoever wants to leave, go. Actually take advantage of the night, leave. Whoever stays is just going to be killed. The companions, to a man, insisted that they would defend the Imam. They showed their loyalty. We would rather be killed. They spoke after that. When they had been given the way out, then the Imam showed them their place in paradise. What Imam Sadiq says is that the veil was removed and they saw their manazil in paradise. They saw their stations in paradise. So now, for us, because we're trying to learn from them, we don't think this happened by magic. There was something they did first, effort they made, and then after that, the Imam saw that readiness, they've done their part, then the Imam steps in, and now 
then they can see their places in paradise before the battle begins. Iman, which is Ashurai. Now, what we're going to try and do is talk about that faith. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. The faith that these men had was something that was very special. And for us as believers, people who are now away from the living Imam and trying to prepare and using Muharram as a dry run, seeing where our place is in history, where we can help out, what we can do, we definitely want to see if we can also at least have the beginnings of what I call that faith which is Ashurai. Without understanding that faith, and with, or God forbid, watering it down so that we make ourselves also equal to those companions, that's a disservice to us. We really need to know what it was, what it is, what Islam demands. Then, if we see that, at least we can move in that direction and we'll get ready to serve our Imam. Faith, brothers and sisters, the faith that they had, that enabled them to pass that test, had some conditions. Every mu'min or mu'mina doesn't have that faith that they had. It's good for us to talk about it. What were the conditions to make their faith acceptable? What do we have to have as the bare minimum of faith in order to be able to serve our imam? I mean, you and I, inshallah, all of us are planning and hoping to be the elite troops of the imam. Shock troops for the imam. But that means that there's some work that we have to do in the background. So what is it that they had, that faith which was Ashurai? As I said, brothers and sisters, there's conditions to it. The first condition, brothers and sisters, is that true faith, this is now, I want to share ayat of the Quran. Right? True faith in Islam, iman in Islam, has certain conditions. If those conditions are there, then one can say, Alhamdulillah, at least I'm a mu'min. I'm inside the door. If not, then we really have to work. What's the first condition? The first condition is that we have to have what's called intellectual conviction. Each and every one of us, you and I, as believers, we have to have intellectual conviction about the faith that we have. There is no way on earth that someone will pass, will be at that test, will be with the ashab of Imam, of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, but then if you ask them, why are you a Muslim? Why are you committed? Why do you do your responsibilities? The person's answer is that, I'm a Muslim because my daddy's a Muslim. It doesn't work like that. Intellectual conviction, brothers and sisters, is that you and I, each and every one of us, are convinced about the tenets of Islam ourselves. We believe in them. Not because of what other people are doing, not because of what other people are saying. You and I are personally convinced about these tenets, and we believe in them. Intellectual conviction. Without intellectual conviction, believers will make mistakes. When you look at the words of our scholars, they say that without intellectual convictions, a group of so-called believers can turn around and be the people who burn the tents of the imam. So the first condition is that you and I have to absolutely be convinced about what it is that we're doing. I believe God is my creator. I believe he's just. I believe he's all-knowing. I believe that. I can confidently say the Quran is literally the word of God from the first till the end. I've accepted this. I've embraced this. Imam Ali is my imam. Because you can't unlearn the truth. What happens, though, is there is a tendency without this to become a ritualist Muslim. And you'll hear me mention this a lot. Because ritual, being a ritualist Muslim, brothers and sisters, is part of the problem and the reason that the Imam is not here. 
There are a lot of people who do a lot of good things. They believe, they practice, they pray. But deep down inside, they're not ideological Muslims. There are areas where they're comfortable with not doing what Allah says. Why is that the case? Part of it is because intellectually, I haven't been convinced. You hear it in the words of people. Sometimes the things that people say when they're presented, when you're talking about Islam, what Islam says, religious, you'll hear the person say, well, I think that's extreme. Islam, a part of Islam, I think that's extreme. That means nobody walked me through this process to actually figure out what it is that I'm doing. Why am I here? What do I say? What do I believe? Intellectual conviction. So what happens is sometimes people will do the right things, but it's not necessarily for the right reasons. And that is dangerous. Somebody doing the right things, not for the right reasons, it shows itself later. Intellectual conviction has to be there. I heard a story that I hope is not true. They say once there was a woman and she was telling her friends, she said that I'm getting married again. They said, you're getting married again? She said, yeah, it's the fourth time. But alhamdulillah, I'm getting married again. They said, well, what happened? If you don't mind, what happened to your husband? She said, well, you see, my previous husband, he died. She said, oh, that's terrible. How did she die? How did he die? He said, well, actually, he ate poison mushrooms. She was like, well, that's terrible. What a terrible way to go. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. What about your second husband? She said, he ate poison mushrooms also. She said, subhanAllah, two husbands, you lost them like that. They ate poison mushrooms. That's so terrible. She said, well, if you don't mind, what happened to your third husband? You said, this is the fourth time you're getting married. She said, my fourth husband died because he had a broken neck. She said, a broken neck? She said, yeah, he wouldn't eat mushrooms. The end result was good. The end result was beautiful. But the way of getting there, someone might be practicing the rituals of Islam, wearing the hijab, making salat, fasting, all the wonderful things. Am I personally convinced? Is this literally because God said? Do people matter in this equation? What the Imam says is whoever comes in to this religion by the book and the sunnah, mountains will move, but this person won't move. Other people will change, other people will not agree, right? But I'm intellectually convinced you can't unlearn the truth. It doesn't matter what people are doing anymore. So intellectual conviction. If you look at the verses of the Quran, you see that Faith for us Muslims, this is what makes us different for the, to the rest of the world. It's a well thought out intellectual conclusion. It's faith with backup, with reasoning. Ayat of the Quran. فَبَشِّرْ ibad. Give good tidings to my servants. الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ Those who listen to the word. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَا and then they follow the best of it. Why are you a Muslim? Because it's the best thing that's out there. Other religions don't make sense. I'm convinced. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلُنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ We sent our prophets with clear proofs. It's not a religion where I'm following because of what other people are doing. Now, that doesn't mean that just because of my intellect, because it's not that hard to grasp. Islam is not like learning a third language. It's so difficult. It's so different. It's not in line with the fitrah. No, this is easy. Especially if a person is not committing a lot of sins. The person who's not committing a lot of sins, Islam makes sense. Either that or hearing a lot of doubts and questions, these kind of things. Otherwise, Islam makes sense. Now, it doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, that just because I have intellectual conviction, I will know all of the answers to any sort of a doubt that anybody brings up. It might be the case that somebody brings up a doubt, 
I don't know. I have to come back. I speak to my local scholar. I seek clarification. It doesn't mean that my intellectual conviction is wrong. It's possible. Somebody go over, they mention something, and I'm not be ready for that. There's a story they tell, and inshallah, it's not true. They said once there was a sister. She was sitting on an airplane, and a man came and was sitting down next to her. And he said, what's that book that you're reading? She said, this is the Quran. He started to laugh. He said, the Quran? You mean that book that talks about that prophet that was swallowed by the whale? Mocking. She said, you mean Prophet Yunus? Yeah. He said, do you believe that stuff? She said, yeah, I believe it. He said, well, then how can you, just tell me, how can someone survive in the belly of a well in the ocean? Tell me how that is. The woman thought for a second. She was like, I'm not sure, actually. The man said, the woman said this. She said that um, when I go to heaven, then I'll tell you. I'll talk to him. I'll find out. The guy said, what if he's not in heaven? She said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> it might be the case that I don't have all of the answers initially, but I know where to refer to. Islam is a religion with an intellectual basis. The first condition for that iman, which was ashurai. Question, is intellectual conviction is that enough that once you have that, then definitely you're in the camp of Imam Hussein. Now you can go. Now you can fight. Actually, no. I want to tell you a story about one of the companions of Imam Hussein. You can look him up later. The Haq bin Abdullah. The Haq bin Abdullah. The Haq bin Abdullah, brothers and sisters, is one of the people who narrated the advents of Karbala for us. He was there in the tent. His story is that he came, he met the Imam, the Imam asked him for help, and from the beginning, the Haq said, I've got a condition. I don't know if we're going to win this one. I've got a condition. He said that I will fight for you as long as I am beneficial for you. And the Imam accepted. The Imam's trying to save everybody. He brought the Haq in. The Haq was there when they started the battle. He was there and then the numbers of the companions started to get reduced. The hawk says this, I noticed the enemy was deliberately trying to hamstring the horses of the imam. He said that I went and I took my horse and I put him in one of the tents. The numbers got to reduce. He, said, he describes this. He says, I was out there. I was fighting. The imam was praying for me. I was in Karbala. I was killing people. The imam was making dua, encouraging me fight. He says, until I notice the numbers start to get reduced, there's only a few of us left. We're not going to make it. He said, I told the imam, we had a deal. The imam said, a deal is a deal. The imam said, how are you going to escape now? And this man was so shameless. He told the imam, he said, well, I hid my horse in one of the tents. The imam said, it's halal for you, go. The hawk went, got his horse, and ran out of Karbala. They chased him, he made it, he survived. He's one of the people who told us this story. So brothers and sisters, just having intellectual conviction, being certain Imam Ali is the first Imam, knowing, even going to the field of, of Karbala, that's not a guarantee. What else do we need? There are other conditions when it comes to faith in Islam needed conditions in order for us to have this faith, which is Ashurai. The second condition that we have to have is the condition of acting on what we know. We're supposed to act on what we know. This is how Islam is separate from other religions. In Islam, it's not just mental acrobatics. It's not just believe and then you're saved. It's not like our Christian brothers and sisters who say that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're saved. We don't say as believers, Imam Hussein died so I can live the life of Yazid. 
Rather, there's expectations that come with faith. If I've been intellectually convinced, if I believe this is God's book, then after that, there are certain things that Allah wants me to do. Islam is very clear about that. What are those things that Islam wants me to do? In some of the verses of Quran, Allah just prints out the principle that obey Allah and the messenger in kuntum mu'mineen. Obey Allah and the messenger if you are believers. Obedience is expected to be part of that faith. Someone who knows has to act. Someone who's understood, this is what Islam says, the expectation is that I will act on those things that I'm taught. Remember, brothers and sisters, these are building blocks. We're trying to go somewhere. We want to be in a different place after these majalis than we are when we first came. In order to do that, we've got to understand where we're going without skipping steps. In Islam, if you know you're expected to act, there's no free pass. There's no getting around it. God expects us to act on what we know. Once they say, and I hope this isn't true, they say that there was a little boy, and this little boy, his dog was very sick. When his dog fell ill, then he decided to talk to his dad about it. And his dad said, we've got to take Benji to the vet. When his dad came back from the vet, the little boy took one look at his dad's face, then he realized everything wasn't okay. His dad said, unfortunately, Benji's not going to make it. He said, that's terrible, and he started to cry. His dad said, but you know what? Benji wouldn't want you to be sad. Benji would want you to remember the good times. And the little boy brightened up. He said, the good times? He said, yeah, Benji wanted to remember the good times. He said, well, Dad, I have some questions for you. He said, what are the questions? He said, when Benji dies, can we have a funeral? And his dad said, why not? Of course, we'll have a funeral for Benji. He said, Dad, can I invite my friends? He said, absolutely, you can invite your friends. He said, can we have cookie and cakes? His dad said, why not? You can have cookie and cakes. He said, Dad, can we kill Benji today? The idea is in Islam that once I know, remember those things I mentioned before, God is my creator. He's the legislator. He knows me. He receives no benefit from the laws that he makes. I'm the one who receives benefits. God is wise. If those things, those building blocks are there, the natural expectation is that now I'm going to act. But you see, there's something else too. Even just having the intellectual conviction, even just knowing that I'm going to act, is that enough to make my faith al shurai to be able to pass the ultimate test? Unfortunately, no. There's another condition. This condition is what separates the men from the boys. This will help us to recognize, am I a ritualist Muslim? Or I'm a Muslim who's moving at least in the direction of Imam Hussein. If I don't have this, the ayat of the Quran, I'm not a mu'min. I'm not a mu'min. Let me give you a little bit about that. But let me explain what it is first and then show you the words of Imam Hussein. So what happens was, in order for me to be a real Muslim, Islam is a package deal. I don't get to pick and choose with Islam. I don't get to have my favorite parts of Islam. All of Islam. Whatever God says. However God says it. That is what's required for me as a Muslim. Three days before the Imam began his journey, he spoke to his companions. He gathered them and gave a short khutbah. The Imam said this, Alhamdulillah, wa ma sha Allah, wa la quwwata illa billah. And then he wrote, and we've heard this, he said that death is written for the children of Adam like the necklace on the neck of a young girl. And he explained how he longed to meet his forefathers. 
And he told them, he said, it's as if I see my flesh being ripped apart by those wolves over in that place called Karbala. He explained how he was pleased with Allah's decree. And then he said something that you and I, as people who are waiting for the Imam, we have to hear. He said this, Man kana baadilan fina muhjatahu. Whoever is ready to give their blood in our way. And you and I, let's think about this. Because we're waiting for a living imam. Are we waiting for that knock on the door where the imam calls and then suddenly my job, what I was doing, my family, my friends, all of that is out the door. Everything is what the imam wants. Take my life. The imam said, whoever is ready to have his blood shed in our way and has mentally prepared themselves to meet God, this person should leave with us. He said, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. There wasn't any time for the believers even to think about it, to understand what's happening. Everything is right now. The imam expects us to be ready to leave everything and sacrifice everything at the drop of a hat. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the end of my part that I want to share today. But I want to talk a little bit before we go to the Masaib about the second and very important part of the program. The important part of the program, brothers and sisters, is in addition to us getting the intellectual content to make sure that emotionally our hearts are ready to serve the cause. The effect of the tears for the Ahlul Bayt have been underestimated. What they do for us spiritually, coming, gathering, crying, being around with others, the effect that they have for us is incredible. This is what Imam Sadiq says about this. He says, Innahu layara man yabki. Imam Hussein sees whoever cries for him. If you have the tawfiq of crying for Imam Hussein, the Imam says this, Allah. The Imam, meaning Imam Hussein, will make istighfar for you, out of rahmah for you. And then after that, Imam Hussein is generous. He doesn't just make istighfar for you, he calls on his forefathers to also pray for you. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al arwah allati hallat bi fina'ik alayka minni salamu Allahi abadan ma baqit wa baqiya al layl wa an nahar wa la ja'alahu Allah akhir al ahdi minni li ziyaratikum Assalamu ala al Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein wa ala awlad al Hussein wa ala ashab al Hussein